Welcome to 30 Online Worship at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am and we all are so pleased that you have chosen and joined with us this morning. We finished our boat last Tuesday and I'm recording this message on Thursday and we are still waiting for the result. And I continue to pray for that when you see this worship that we have some clue or some result so they have a no more chaotic or no more waiting. But I continue to pray there and I need your pray and we all need the peace of our Christ. So may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, especially the waiting and result. Now, please let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our Almighty God as we receive this morning's prelude. Please join with me call to worship this morning. Unless God builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless God guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that we rise up early 
and go to bed great. We put our trust in God. Let us worship God. Please join with me time of confession, silent prayer, and assurance of God's pardon. Let us slow down. Let us be in step with the one who works with us. God of infinity possibility, you see us as we are, as we can be, as we create us to be, but we lack your vision, your capacity to love. We cannot seem to love ourselves, so we cannot truly love others. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us to love as you love. Help us give freely of ourselves, so we may appreciate the gift of others. In Christ's name. <laughs> Rejoice in the knowledge that in Christ our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The The peace peace of Christ Christ be with with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with with you you from California. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Today's reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Scripture reading today is from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, beginning with the first verse. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, the officials of Israel. And they presented themselves before the Lord. And Joshua said said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his son Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. And then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the lands of Canaan and made his offspring many. And then skipping down to verse 14. Now therefore, revere the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. 
But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. The people said to Joshua, No, no, we will serve the Lord. So then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Joshua said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you. Incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve. Him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. Here ends our reading from the book of Joshua, chapter 24. In the summer of 2016, there was a heat wave in the Siberian wilderness near the Arctic Circle, and, and the ice melted, and, and uh, there was all kinds of problems because of the, uh, the water and the lakes and, and the ice melting, and, and all of a sudden they, they noticed that a number of the reindeer in the area were dying off, and, and uh, then the people, the natives that lived there and tended the reindeer were getting sick and and some of them were dying and so they investigated and they discovered that some of the people had anthrax and what had happened deer reindeer that had caught anthrax back in 1941 and and had died and been frozen in the ground had come to the surface when the ice melted, and that anthrax, dormant for years and years, came back to life and infected the reindeer herds, infected the ground, infected the people, and people died. Once they discovered that, they had vaccinations and medicines to help out. But then they had the problem of, of all of these dead reindeer, several thousand reindeer that had died. And, and they couldn't just be buried because the anthrax would stay alive. And, and so they had to be incinerated at uh, high, high temperatures. And then after they were incinerated, the ashes had to be washed down with bleach. That was the extent of a problem that they had. And we have been journeying from the Exodus from Egypt and entered the Promised Land last week as the people led by Joshua crossed over the Jordan on dry land. And once they were across the Jordan, they celebrated the Passover and then they began the work of conquering the people of Canaan. And the story says that Joshua conquered Jericho, saving out only Rahab, who had helped the spies and hidden them. But all the other people were destroyed. Men, women, children, livestock, the whole town was destroyed as if it had anthrax and, and was a deadly virus or toxin for the people. God issued a ban. Do not let anything survive. It is unclean. It is dangerous. So the story, the first half of the book of Joshua, 
tells the story of Joshua and the Israelites going from town to town to town, conquering the town, killing all the people, totally destroying the town. One time, one time someone tried to keep some gold and silver and he was discovered and he was stoned to death because God had put a ban. Nothing, nothing of the Canaanites should be kept. Nothing should survive. So we go from town to town to town. No survivors, no survivors, no survivors. How can we as Christians read these words? The, the chapters are full of blood and violence. We as Christians are adopted children of Abraham. We, we are Israelites by adoption. So we too have blood on our hands. How, how can this be? How can the Bible talk this way? Just wiping a whole people out. No survivor, no survivor, no survivor. How can it be? We know of the Holocaust, the killing of millions of Jews by the Nazis during World War II. Uh, we know of other kinds of, of uh, exterminations of people. Myanmar persecuted Christians and, and is now persecuting the Rohingyas. Uh, the Chinese government is uh, having a, a constant persecution of ethnic groups in the western part of China. Uh, there are reports that as many as a million people have been interred in re-education camps. We, we know this. And we know our own history as Americans with the Trail of Tears and, and the atrocities to Native Americans and, and the slave trade. We, we know all of this. How can, we, how can we listen to this in Scripture? I don't have any easy answers. But I'd like to suggest first that we read the scriptures carefully because it shows something that is not obvious at first. When you begin to read, you discover that in spite of this litany of total destruction of city after city after city, it, it didn't actually happen that way. Uh, no, it turned out that many people survived. To take one example, De Beer. De Beer was totally wiped out. There were no survivors. And yet later on, we read that there were still inhabitants in the city. And then even later on, as Joshua is apportioning the land, it, it turns out that the city was still there. So these cities were not actually totally destroyed the way it says or the way it seems. How, how is that? Is the scripture not faithful and true? Well, actually, I think you might say that there is a theological truth, but not a historical truth, maybe a symbolic truth. Because from the early days of Genesis, there was the promise to Abraham's descendants that they would possess the land. And as they left from Egypt, they were promised they would possess the land. So here you now have that promise fulfilled. The Canaanites are destroyed. They possess the land. The 21st chapter of Joshua, after they have conquered the land, it says, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to their ancestors that he would give them. 
And having taken possession of it, they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. No one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All had come to pass. Well, that statement is true in a way, but not very accurate because there were still many enemies in the land. And as we know from reading Judges, the people of Israel were basically up in the hills and the Philistines were all over the valleys and the cities. So theoretically, the Lord has given the people the land, but actually, actually, they have not. And all this talk about wiping out all the people as if they were anthrax that, that would be deadly simply, simply was not so. I think of it in a way as um, something that uh, bothers me from time to time, and I'll confess this now. Ha have you ever heard of this uh, chant almost uh, that sometimes occurs in contemporary worship. The, the leader will say, God is good, and the people will respond all the time. The leader will say, all the time, the people will respond, God is good. I, I confess when I hear that, I think, is that really true? God is good all the time. I certainly did not feel that way when my oldest son was murdered 27 years ago. I didn't feel that God was good all the time when my wife died after five years fighting an incurable cancer. God is good most of the time, but all the time? This is not simply my struggle. The book of Job struggles with this understanding, and some of the Psalms do as well. I can affirm God is good. God is good, but all the time? God has conquered the land for the people, but not all the land and not all the people. So, so one way to look at this, this sense of God authorizing the extermination of a people is to see that it simply did not happen. Now there's another kind of complicated explanation for some of this as well that, that I have read in some of the scholars. If you notice the cities that are destroyed are royal cities. They had kings, and there's a list of 30-something kings that are defeated and killed by Joshua and the Israelites. And specifically, they are told to destroy the chariots and the horses. Chariots and horses in that day would be like tanks and armored personnel carriers today driving into an Iraqi village, for example, or, or like some of the uh, helicopter gunships that descend suddenly on a Taliban village in Afghanistan. They were the weapons of war and, and, and of conquest, sometimes the weapons of oppression. So some of the scholars have noted that the Israelites coming into the land specifically targeted the kings who were not simply leaders of cities. They were the power, the oppressors in that area. They were the ones who were eliminated primarily. 
Now, this has some merit when you think about in the second half of the book, Joshua apportions the land to the 12 tribes, each person to his own clan or family. Each Israelite family received an allotment of land. Unlike the kings who lived by coercion and power and, and acquired great wealth, the Israelites were to be equal. Each person would have his own land. Now, it didn't always work out that way. And later on, the prophets, centuries later, in the 8th century B.C., would <clears throat> complain about people who were grabbing up the land and building houses next to houses, who were grasping after wealth and power. But ideally, ideally, in conquering the land and in allotting the land, there was to be justice, a sense of equality. Every Israelite would have his own land to till. And that land was a gift alone from God, not to be given up. So, so we have this, this painful word of, of executing, of, of killing, of, of, of blood. And, and they're not any just obvious, easy answers. But I think we can see at the best that the story from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Israelites coming out of Egypt and coming into the promised land is a continuation of God's promises for his people. In the scripture we read for today, Joshua has gotten old. He recognizes he will not live too much longer. And so he gathers the people together at Shechem. And remember that the people that left Egypt have all died off because they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and were not allowed to enter the promised land. And, and so these people are, are new. That They may not have been at Sinai. They may not have heard the giving of the covenant. And so Joshua wants to to renew the covenant with these people as they begin their life together in the land that God has promised. It, it would be kind of like a, a, a couple uh, renewing their wedding vows or like uh, someone who was baptized renewing their baptismal vows or again in churches that practice infant baptism, as a person comes to age where they can confirm their baptismal vows. So, so this covenant ceremony, this worship service to renew their vows was, was a significant point in the history of Israel. And Joshua says to the people, here is what God has done for you. He has brought our ancestors out of the land beyond the river, modern Iraq. And, and he has brought them to this point. So he rehearses the history. And then he says to them, choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose whom you will serve. Will you serve the Lord God? Will you turn aside to serve other gods? And, and they say, no, we'll serve the Lord. We'll serve the Lord. And, and Joshua says to them again, no, no, you cannot serve the Lord because 
The Lord is a holy God. The Lord is a jealous God. Uh, if you turn away from the Lord, you will be punished. You can't serve the Lord. Yes, yes, we will. We will serve the Lord. Joshua says to them yet a third time, you can't do it. And they say, we will. And then they say, you will be witnesses against yourself. And they say, yes, yes, we will be witnesses that we will serve the Lord and him only will we serve. They have recommitted themselves to the Lord. And they have committed themselves to put aside any foreign gods. I, I think you and I are called from time to time, not every Sunday perhaps, but to renew our commitment to the Lord. To say with Joshua, we will serve the Lord and him only we will serve the Lord. That meant for the people of Israel abandoning all the other gods, and it means for us abandoning any other gods. Now, you and I do not worship other gods, do we? Uh, I mean, we don't think we do, but it has been said that whatever we hold most dear that, that is our God, whatever we hold most dear. What do we hold dear in our society? I think it's me. Or put another way, it's the self. I have mentioned in sermons before that I think the symbol of our age is a selfie. We even have selfie sticks that allow us to easily take pictures of ourselves, so we can send them to all our three million friends, right? I am my God. I worship only me. I, I think about only myself. And we may say I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in and worship God only. But if in our living we practice self-worship, then these words come to us. We are witnesses against ourselves that we will serve the Lord and Him only. we find ourselves very often wrapped up only in ourselves. How many times have you heard someone say, well, I'm not going to wear a mask. Okay, maybe you don't see the medical information the same way I do. But if you just say, I'm not going to wear a mask because no one can make me wear a mask. I do whatever I want. Isn't that worshiping the self? I also read something of interest in the Tulsa World recently about the problems of uh, education these days when we have online learning and the problem of cheating, right? It's very easy to cheat when you're worship, working online. There's nobody looking over your shoulder. Even from what I understand, even the, uh, the software that might prevent you from looking up answers when you're using a program cannot keep you from pulling out your cell phone and going to the cell phone to look up answers. So uh, there, there is a problem of cheating which again is simply self-worship. It is saying that what I want is more important than any rules, any morality, any, anything else. There was in the article in the Tulsa World about cheating, a quotation from a student. 
And, and I'm not going to mention her name, even though the article did. But it said that she had graduated from a particular high school in our area last year and that she found 90% of the answers for her senior English and history classes online. She said she didn't see any issue with looking up answers because they were classes I needed to graduate and none of the information I will need in my career. Do you hear the, the logic in that? It's okay to cheat on the English and history classes because all she needs from that is a grade and a credit. She wouldn't cheat on the classes that she might need for her career because then she would be hurting herself. But the, the only value is how it either helps or hurts her. 20 years ago, there was a book uh, about teenagers and parents called A Tribe Apart by Patricia Hirsch. And she comments, that teenagers have a murky understanding of ethics and moral values. They must figure out a moral code on their own because they're not getting any help from adults. Many teenagers lack a conscience and they indulge in risky behaviors often because they just don't know any better. They just don't know any better. One of the teenagers she interviewed made a comment very similar to the one I just read from the Tulsa World. And they said they would cheat on any courses except the ones in their interest where they were going to go to college. So someone who wanted to be a doctor would cheat on history and English, but would not cheat on chemistry, for example, because he needed that information himself. 20 years ago, A Tribe Apart was saying that young people were lacking in any kind of morality and values because adults were not working with and helping them. And this week, yet another teenager confirmed that. Choose this day whom you will serve. Will you serve the Lord? Will you serve other gods? It's, it's more complicated for us because we do not label these other values as gods, but surely self-serving without consideration for other people is another God. We are called upon to choose the Lord and Him only serve. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you have been with your people through the centuries to this day. We pray, O oh Lord, that we may be found faithful amidst all the temptations to self-worship and to ignore the concerns and values of others. We pray, Lord, you will be with us, that your spirit will, will open our eyes and our ears that we may see and know and serve you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me this on a Monday before the election tomorrow, so I do not know how that will turn out, whether your candidate will win or not, whether there'll be confusion in the counting of the ballots or not. But I do know, I do know that the Lord will be with us no matter what. And, and in a practical way, when we have experienced stress before in our society. I've always told people, go talk to your grandparents. Grandparents of people my age lived through the Great Depression, through World War II. They had a lot of experience with adversity and they survived. I, I personally have lived through the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, of Martin Luther King Jr of all the uh, uncertainties of the 1960s, of the resignation of President Nixon, it, it goes on and on. And I can say to you, in spite of everything, life goes on. We will go on. And God will hold us in his hands the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with us every day. Amen. Shine your light in 
the way we live Send us out in the power of your spirit As we've received, may we freely give Send us out, send us out, send us out for your glory That's all we do, we praise to you Send us out for your glory Send us out in the power of your spirit To show your love everywhere we go Send us out in the power of your spirit. Lord, fill us up so we overflow. Send us out, send us out.